One hundred years ago, Abraham Lincoln signed the National Currency Act. And this Connecticut bank, founded in 1806, became the Connecticut National Bank. Today, the many offices of CNB in big towns and small serve southeastern Connecticut and the Naugatuck Valley. CNB education loans are sending Connecticut young people to colleges and universities all over the country, paying tuition fees, room and board, helping young men and women prepare for happy, useful lives. This is just one of the many ways CNB serves you and your community. Now the Connecticut National Bank brings you the Screen News Digest. For many years, the office of vice president was the subject of scorn and ridicule. Benjamin Franklin said the vice president should be addressed as your superfluous excellency. Thomas Marshall, who was vice president under Woodrow Wilson, told the story of two brothers. The first ran away to sea. The other was elected vice president. Nothing, said Marshall, was ever heard from either one again. In the Broadway musical of The I Sing, Vice President Alexander Throttlebottom spent his time feeding pigeons in the park and looking for two persons as references for a library card. But events of recent years have dramatically altered what Americans expect of the man who is but a heartbeat away from the most powerful office in the free world. And in this exclusive report, the Screen News Digest examines in historical perspective the changing role of the American Vice Presidency. The office of Vice President was one of the great afterthoughts of the Constitutional Convention of 1787. It was not even considered until less than two weeks before adjournment. The Constitution did not originally provide for separate votes for president and vice president. Rather, the person who received the highest number of electoral votes was to be president and the runner-up vice president. Under this system, it was presumed the second most qualified man in the country would be vice president and heir apparent to the presidency. At first, it worked out that way. But it soon became clear that able men would not be happy with the meager duties of the vice presidency. For the Constitution gave the vice president only the power to preside over the Senate and to cast a vote in case of a tie. John Adams, our first vice president, complained bitterly that my country has contrived for me the most insignificant office ever invented by man. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson, running for president, and Aaron Burr, candidate for vice president, received the same number of electoral votes. The House of Representatives finally named Jefferson as president, and America adopted the 12th Amendment, providing that separate votes be cast in the Electoral College for vice president and president. With Jefferson's election, development of the two-party system, and the growth of national conventions, the vice presidency became a political pawn. An Easterner would be paired with a Westerner, or a liberal with a conservative, in hopes of balancing national tickets. In 1841, William Henry Harrison, nicknamed Old Tippy Canoe, became the first president to die in office. Now history would be made by Vice President John Tyler. Harrison's death raised a serious constitutional question. Would John Tyler become president, or would he merely be acting president? Tyler insisted that he was president, in fact, in name, and in every other respect. He took the oath of office. He demanded all of the privileges and powers of the presidency, residence in the White House, presidential salary, and the rest. And despite opposition from Congress, Tyler's position prevailed. It has continued to prevail and to serve the country well down through the years. 
For without it, chaos might well have developed following a number of presidential deaths. Throughout the 1800s, the vice presidency was filled by few men of skill and stature. And yet three presidents, Zachary Taylor, Abraham Lincoln, and James Garfield, died in office. When William McKinley was assassinated, he was succeeded by Theodore Roosevelt, regarded by many historians as the greatest of America's accidental presidents. Ironically, he had been chosen for vice president because his enemies wanted to bury him politically in a job they considered unimportant. A different presidential crisis involving Woodrow Wilson focused new attention on the vice presidency. In 1919, Wilson undertook a grueling cross-country tour in the support of the League of Nations. The strain proved too much. Wilson collapsed. Woodrow Wilson lay near death, and the legal question of presidential disability hung over the White House. For a month, he took no official action, considered no legislative matters, made no appointments to office, and issued no state paper. But Mrs. Wilson would not let her husband resign. And without constitutional authority, she determined what matters should be brought to his attention. One senator said, we have a petticoat government. Mrs. Wilson is president. Ultimately, Wilson recovered and managed to serve out his term. But the crisis underscored the Constitution's failure to spell out ways of defining and dealing with presidential disability. As the president struggled to regain his health, Vice President Marshall refused to take over for him. I'm not going to seize the place, said Marshall, and then have Wilson come around and say, get out, you usurper. And so the presidency passed in 1921 to Warren Harding, and America embarked on an era of normalcy. But Harding's ill-fated presidency would last less than two years and five months. With his death in August 1923, Calvin Coolidge became the sixth vice president in American history to succeed to the presidency. And still the office continued to be largely ceremonial. The duties of Charles Curtis, vice president under Herbert Hoover, included opening the 1932 Summer Olympic Games in Los Angeles. of the President of the United States, I proclaim open the Olympic Games of Los Angeles, celebrating the 10th Olympiad of the modern era. In 1938, a rare and historic event, with Vice President John Lance Garner presiding, motion picture cameras were allowed to photograph the United States Senate in session. After a century and a half, the Vice President's official duties had not changed. However, his salary had been increased from five to $12,000 a year. And Vice President Garner, who served two terms under Franklin D. Roosevelt, became the first Vice President to visit a foreign country on official business. In 1941, after opposing Roosevelt's third term, Garner was succeeded by Henry Wallace. And now he took over the job of throwing out the first ball on the opening day of the baseball season. With America's entry into World War II, the vice president became a vigorous advocate of physical fitness and an enthusiastic supporter of victory gardens. There were, however, more serious duties. In 1944, Wallace was sent to China on a fact-finding mission. Madam Chiang Kai-shek welcomed the vice president to the homeland of America's wartime ally in the Far East. But the visit, like most vice presidential travels, was more ceremonial than significant. The journey to China would be Henry Wallace's last major official assignment. 
year later, Harry Truman became President Roosevelt's third vice president. Wallace himself administered the oath to the man who took his place. In Truman's 82 days as vice president, he conferred only twice with President Roosevelt. And when FDR died, Truman was shocked to learn that he, the second ranking official in government, had not even been told of the development of the atom bomb. When Truman was nominated and elected to his own four-year term as president in 1948, he saw to it that his vice president, Alvin Barkley, became a new force in American political life. Although Barclay, at 71, was the oldest man to serve as vice president, he visited the front lines during the Korean War. A widower, he married Jane Hadley in 1949 and became the first vice president to take a bride in office. Asked to kiss his bride, the Veep firmly declined. No, no kisses. We'll reserve that till later. <laughs> That's awful fresh. <laughs> President Eisenhower's eight years in office continued to see an increase in the responsibilities of the vice presidency. Three times in eight years, Ike was stricken with major illnesses. In the president's absence, the continuity of government was maintained as Vice President Nixon presided over 19 cabinet meetings and 26 sessions of the National Security Council. Under President Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson continued the tradition of global missions and special assignments. Visiting West Berlin after construction of the wall, he told the people, you are not alone. In two years and 10 months, Johnson made 11 separate tours outside of the United States, more than any other vice president in history. After President Kennedy's tragic death, a constitutional amendment was passed establishing for the first time procedures for dealing with presidential disability and filling the office of vice president when vacant because of death, resignation, or succession to the presidency. Sixteen times in the history of the Republic, the office of vice president, the office created to provide continuity in the executive, itself has been vacant. Seven men have died while vice president. John C. Calhoun resigned and eight others left the office vacant when succeeding to the presidency. The 25th Amendment clarifies the crucial clause that provides for succession to the presidency and fulfilling a vice presidential vacancy. With the resignation of Vice President Spiro Agnew in 1973, the provisions of the 25th Amendment were used for the first time. The new vice president, sworn in before a joint session of Congress, was Gerald R. Ford of Michigan, a veteran of 25 years in the House of Representatives. He had been nominated by President Nixon and approved by a majority of both houses of Congress. As I have throughout my public service under six administrations, I will try to set a high example of respect for the crushing and lonely burdens which the nation lays upon the President of the United States. Mr. President, you have my support and my loyalty. As America's 40th Vice President, Gerald Ford assumed an office that has changed significantly in the years since the Constitutional Convention of 1787. The duties and the prestige of the vice presidency are on the rise.
office, and occupant have become closely involved with the innermost workings of the executive branch of our government. And in the future, vice presidents probably will be given even more important responsibilities than those of today. For Americans have come to ask for and to expect more than token service from the man who stands but a heartbeat away from the presidency. The Screen News Digest was brought to you by your nearby office of the Connecticut National Bank. A full service bank contributing to the civic life, commercial life, and industrial life of your community. This film was presented as a public service. <laughs>